Today on The Grave Talks, we'll talk about the haunts of Wichita with the Kansas ghost lady, Tina Sorensen, and her son, Sid Sorensen. Wichita is a city rich in history. From gunslingers to serial killers, we've had it all here. And it's no surprise that many of those who have passed on haven't moved on. Wichita is where I've called home for most of my adult life. And this episode is particularly fun for me to get to talk about some local haunts. Tina Sorensen is known as the Kansas Ghost Lady. She's given haunted Wichita tours, done paranormal investigations locally, and even started a paranormal club at a high school where she teaches English. Her son, Sid, is a history teacher and knows his Wichita history. Today, on this episode of The Grave Talks, Wichita Haunts. Okay, so I'm going to just dive in today and start with you, Tina. You're also known as the Kansas Ghost Lady, which, by the way, is how I stumbled upon you. We don't know each other until no, today. we don't. How did you get interested in the paranormal? How did you become Kansas Ghost Lady? Okay. Well, it actually goes back to when I was a teenager, and I had a few experiences that I didn't really talk about, and one was with the stereotypical Ouija board, and um, I was playing with some friends, and they just said, I acted kind of weird, and we ended up calling a phone number off the Ouija board, and it was uh, the parent of a child that had drowned like the day before, and it was just... What? It was... Whoa, 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 back back (laughs) up. So you're playing and goofing off on the Ouija board, as kids do. I did the same thing. Yes. And your granddaughters who are here, don't do that. No. (laughs) But um, the Ouija board gave you a phone number. Right. And then you called it. We called it, and we actually we actually had a name off of the Ouija board. It was spelled wrong, and we don't know if it was Danny or you know Damien or something or Derek. We don't know, but we mentioned the name, and the lady got real quiet on the phone and said, "This is a cruel joke." And we were like, "No, we we just want to talk to him real quick." And she said, "He drowned yesterday," and she slammed the phone down, and we never called back. So. Yeah, that is crazy. And this is back in the day where you had the phones in the the hallway, like the long cord. The hard, and yeah, yeah, there's no call waiting, and if you try to call somebody, it's busy. And so we, I thought they had done it to me. They thought I had done it to them. So we threw the Ouija board in the trash. And um, a couple of days later, I was going to school with my friend because I was rode with her, and we kind of heard a, a rattling in the back of the car. So when we got to school, we opened up the back and the Ouija board was in there. And I thought she had done it. I said, that is not funny. And she was mad at me. And so we threw it out in the trash there at school. And then a couple days later, the same thing happened. And we were a little bit freaked out. So we really, to this day, don't know if somebody was messing with us. But we did take it that time. And we actually broke it in half and burned it. And so that that's was where pretty it much the, your only option at that point. <laughs> yeah. This Ouija board was not going away. Yeah. So, and you know, I never told my parents or anybody about it because I was like, They're, this was in the 80s. You know, nobody's going to believe this. And um, so I kind of kept it to myself. And I did see something when I was younger in Oklahoma when we lived there. And what it boiled down to is I was at a slumber party and we saw a little girl outside. It was out kind of in the, outer banks of Oklahoma city. And, um, when I talked about it later, there was like, there was nobody down there at the, it was a a house being built apparently. And, um, they said, you can't be talking about this person. There was a cold case of a girl out there. And, you know, I was young, I was like 10 or so, and I wouldn't, wasn't reading the newspaper. So, and that's a pretty long story. I actually wrote it on a, I actually wrote it on a, um, Wattpad. I'm starting that up and just putting my ghost stories there for anyone to read. That's so. interesting. And another thing that really fascinated me about you was the fact that you founded a paranormal club at one of the local high schools. And there yes. can't be many paranormal clubs at high schools, I'm guessing. No. All I know of is, I mean, I teach at West High School here in Wichita. I guess because right around October, I always tell the ghost stories. And they never knew they were 
about me, and I have several. In fact, I was pregnant with my son when Who's I was here today, and yes. we're going to meet in just a second. <laughs> when one happened, but uh, some students came up one day and said, "Hey, we talked to the principal, and they said you could be our paranormal club sponsor." I said, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> And I really didn't want to because I think people get confused about what it really is. It's more about proving it's false Mm -hmm. than it is, oh, I believe in every little noise. Because you have to really research and knock out everything that it could be. And so I I finally decided to. And the first time, I mean, we went to Delano and did a, we helped with a haunted ghost tour one year down there. And then... um, We've just basically, I show them how to investigate with just basic equipment, not all that fancy stuff they use. And I take them on the tour of the, the we call it the basement, but you know, West was a fallout shelter and you can go down below it and walk oh, all underneath Oh, I it. didn't realize that. Yeah. So we've been doing it and it's it was kind of on hiatus for a year or so, but this year I'll start it back up and another high school discovered it and they contacted me and wanted to know how to get one started, and now they have one started. So. I love that. It's fun. So, Sid, yeah. you are Tina's son. I am. Hello. Hi. Thanks for being here today. Pleasure to be here. So, you are also a teacher. I am. I am a history teacher. And you teach at a middle school? Yes. So, is it your mom's interest in the paranormal that got you interested in the paranormal? Have you had your own experiences? How does that kind of work? So what's kind of funny about that is the way that I describe it to people, whenever people find out that my that my mom is like really involved in paranormal, because um, it goes kind of larger than that. It's kind of both my parents. Both of my parents have always been really involved in like the paranormal world and stuff like that. And the way that I describe it to people is like my involvement in the paranormal world as a child is the same as any other child in their involvement with Blue's Clues and Elmo. I get that. I get that. It was literally just like it was instilled into my brain. And it's not it was never like a negative thing. But both my parents just it was something that interested them. And so they wanted me and my siblings to kind of share that interest as well. And. I think the youngest experience, the youngest I remember anything happening was when I was four with my mom, when we heard knocking on the inside of the old house on the way to preschool, when she was pregnant with my sister, there was um, knocking on the inside of our house. And my mom tells me the story, but I guess I just looked at my mom and I was like, what is, what is that? And she just looks at me and she goes, get in the car, just get in the car right now, get in the car. (laughs) We're not going to talk about it. We go to school. Um, at the time she worked at South and in South there's a daycare. And so I was there. And so I would go to the daycare just with my mom because this was before I was in elementary school right. or anything. So when we came back from school, all the doors and all the windows were open. But what? there was a nest of bunnies by the house and the cops were like, this nest of bunnies hasn't moved. So whatever happened came from inside the house. But none of the alarms had been triggered. And this was shortly after my grandpa had pa- or my, my grandpa had passed away a few years earlier. And so between the time frame of my grandpa had passing away Um, There was some there was some activity that was happening just not only in my house, but also surrounding my dad and my grandma. So that was really the first experience that I had had with paranormal. And then ever since then, I think that kind of opening up, opening up both my parents were like, so you've been exposed to this. So let's let's discuss it. So I grew up thinking that every I grew up thinking everybody had their parents tell them ghost stories. And then it was a shock to my system to find out that my friends did not. But I was lucky enough to where I had some friends in middle school that were like, this is actually really cool. See, and when I was a kid, we had a haunted house and I was embarrassed of it. I was like, oh, I don't know where my house is haunted. And because you don't want that additional. So I'm glad that you found some people you were comfortable with. Oh, yeah. Now, the haunted house here in Wichita then. Mm-hmm. One of several. Yeah. <laughs> well, this house that that Sid was talking about was actually my husband's house that he lived in for like 25 years. And what happened was um, when Sid was about seven months old, my father-in-law passed away from an an accident. My mother-in-law was just having a very hard time staying in the house with all the memories. So she asked if we would move into it while she got it ready to sell. And I was pregnant with Shelby and, um, she was going to another house. So we moved into this house, but I had already had several episodes of some interesting things happening in that house. 
And uh, what it boils down to was when they lived there, my husband's youngest brother was coming home from school and he's not ever supposed to, the turnpike runs behind their house and he's not supposed to jump the fence. He has to walk around. Well, he jumped the fence and ran across and he was hit by a car and killed instantly. I was yeah. so afraid you were going to yeah. say that, and you did. And it was hard because... I can't imagine. Just all the stories I've heard about things that happened in the house for a while. And, you know, I was, I was kind of skeptical. And, uh, no, there were several times I was there. I've even dreamed of him. And the, the bedroom where he stayed, we could never keep that door closed. And it wasn't a loose hinge or it wasn't unleveled. It would ju- we close and stay closed, but there'd be times it would just open. And our I had a foreign exchange daughter mm. that lived down there. We didn't tell her anything about the house, and oh, I'm sure Gabby is not real thrilled with it. But she came running up one night. Oh my gosh, Tina, the door just opened, and I was it's like, like oh, about okay. that. It happens <laughs> me, all let the me time. Talk to you. And <laughs> she wasn't too thrilled, but we've had a lot of. <laughs> I've had keys move, which you hear about that, but literally keys move and I was in the house by myself one time and someone was walking upstairs and I just said oh okay I'm gonna have to go so (laughs) I just didn't even acknowledge it and left but it kind of makes me wonder sometimes is it the house or the person I agree and I think it can be both yeah I think it can be the house but I also think it can follow the person kind of once you're open to it I think that you know that the dead zone that that show They've been here twice to Wichita, and they've mm-hmm. they've actually one of the houses they went to in the Delano district. Mm-hmm. They finally figured well. out that it was her that was haunted, not the house. She was being followed. Yep. I I always have a I just under I don't understand people when they say I believe in angels, but I don't believe in ghosts. And if you want to be technical with the term, ghosts are really residual. They're they're recordings. It's a spirit that would be aware of its surroundings. And usually, from my experience, when someone passes, if they still had something to do or they might be refusing it or they might just want to comfort a loved one, the spirit will hang around for a little bit and mm-hmm. you will feel it. My, my grandmother was very close to, and I stayed with her every summer. I'm from Georgia. And I would stay in her house. No plumbing or electricity except the kitchen had a sink and a refrigerator that was on power. And... Um, When she died, I was 18, and I I really struggled with it. And every night after her death, for three straight weeks, I would go to bed, and I would smell her snuff. And snuff is like a female version of tobacco, and they spit it. Um, But it it looks like powdered coffee, and it smells like coffee. I haven't thought of that in years. Yeah, and I used to always get the scoop out for her from the hutch, and um, I smelled it for three straight weeks, and it really comforted me, and then it just disappeared. But I think we all have that that sense in us that we're, we're so stuck to science and what has to be evidence that we can't just allow ourselves to believe that there might be something there. I, I just really think that if people would just relax and realize, hey, it's happening, or they can ignore it if it makes them, if you ignore it, it's going to go away. But if you constantly address something or ask something, then you're going to get a response. So if you don't want that, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, I just always believed if you're going to believe in a higher being or if you're going to believe in angels or anything like that, why not believe in spirits or ghosts? My sister and I just had that conversation recently. Mm -hmm. So you lived in Wichita for quite a while, probably met some other people in the community, like-minded, did you start these ghost tours of Wichita with them, or was that more with your well, husband? Well, actually, um, my dad, uh, my my uh, my late father, he was military, so we moved to Derby. Mine too. So he was stationed yes. here. Okay. Well, actually retired, and we we moved here. The way I got to do the ghost tours, it was a company that some people owned, and they actually ran it through a house like I want to say in Arizona or something, and then other people would apply. But then we were responsible for putting the tour together and the history together and all that, and people would purchase tickets, and then I would get you know a little pay for it. Honestly, I didn't care about the pay. I just loved it so much. 
Um, and then eventually they had to close. I think there was a health issue or something, and they just couldn't do it anymore. And so I stopped. But I had some really fun experiences. We started, and I created this on my own. We started with the Orpheum Theater, which everyone knows mm-hmm. Haunted. is completely. The Orpheum Theater is wild. <laughs> the Orpheum Theater for was built close to 100 years ago. There are quite a few buildings in Wichita that, are so old that are still around mm-hmm. and are su- that are used as such big public institutions that nobody really registers how much is behind it. And the Orpheum is one of them. Now I've never been in there by myself, but I have been in there before backstage. In fact, recently last year I was backstage with an artist who was performing there because mm-hmm. her and I are friends and she doesn't live here. She's from, she lives now in Nashville. She's like, so, how haunted is this place? And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, pretty haunted. Very- well, the, the, the Wichita Paranormal Research Society that's here, they, and they're affiliated with TAPS, which is the Atlantic, mm-hmm. with, you know, Jason Haw and yeah. Grant. She has video of some movement. She's had her hair pulled. Um, it's, it's, she's really into the Orpheum. She likes going there. But I, <laughs> I'll go ahead and tell you, about my experience with the Orpheum. And the Orpheum was the vaudeville days. We were just there last year. We w- went and saw Whose Line Is It Anyway. Um, has the best acoustics. Anybody who's anybody has played at that room. Yes. And it's like a lot of um, theaters in cities where they had these very ornate theaters, very fancy. And then, like Wichita, a lot of them went into disrepair, they closed it down, and now they're trying to bring them back to their glory, which is what we've been trying to do with that theater here. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because we started at the Orpheum, and I had a group one time. (laughs) It was so funny. And one of them was a a principal in the school district. I won't won't say his name. But the side doors to the Orpheum were open that night. We couldn't go in the actual Orpheum. They were, because they're they're doing some construction. Mm -hmm. And we went upstairs to the third floor, or on it was like a, a side of the building to it and for some reason and I had this little um, I can't remember what it was I used but there was a beeping and it seemed to follow this guy it followed him all the way up it followed him away from us the group and it just kept following him until he got so freaked out he ran out and said that's it I'm done I'm out of here and he was gone and then I guess he told some of the other principals and then they are all talking about wanting to come do a tour because they they thought it was great because this was a pretty manly tough guy and it really upset him. Do so. they have any idea of what haunts the Orpheum? Are there some theories out there? Did something tragic happen to somebody there or in terms of like the the history of the Orpheum, the Orpheum was used a lot during um Cowtown days, much like the Drury, which I would love to get into later because the Drury itself though I it do is, want to talk about that. Though hotel. it is a chain the Drury is probably one of my favorite buildings in all of Wichita. The Drury and East High are my two favorite buildings in terms of history and haunts in all of Wichita. But the Orpheum is very similar to the Drury in terms of like it drew in a lot of attention for Cowtown when Delano was nothing but a big cattle ran town. It was when it was like the Wild West, cowboys, mm-hmm. um, hookers. You had no, literally hookers. You had, and then yeah. you had the Eaton Place that was right up there, and. Before the Eaton Place, you know those apartments? Before it was Eaton Place, it was the Hotel Eaton, which was a bar that Carrie Nation yes. went in and chopped to bits with her hatchet. Well, people would escape over there because the Orpheum also had its own history of bootlegging. Oh, I did not know that. Yes, and so the Orpheum was used kind of as like a middle ground for bootlegging as well. And so there was a lot of bloodshed that happened because of that, whether and nobody could confirm or deny whether or not the Orpheum was connected to Al Capone. But there were suspicions that the Orpheum was connected as a middle ground with Al Capone because the Eaton Place was connected with Al Capone. But there were thought processes that the Eaton Place and the Orpheum was connected to Al Capone. And the Orpheum was like an underground middle system to get booze in during the time of Prohibition. And they would have a theater has some under... I don't know if they have tunnels there, but it's not uncommon to have rooms down below because you need rooms to store things. You need dressing rooms and all that. And the Drury Hotel used to be called the Broadview. And they also have that same history because they had a speakeasy down there. And so on the river, they would come in on the river at night and they would bring in, you know, the illegal drink, the alcohol, the elixir of evil. (laughs) And they would bring it in there and... 
I think Al Capone was connected in that area too. He was, yeah. Wyatt Earp. I mean, there's so much about our history that today a lot of our our kids don't know, and it's just so rich. The Delano area is rich with his. We used to have an amusement park in the middle of the river. But that hotel, which I stayed in here recently, and it's lovely, um, Clarence is the name of the ghost. That's what I've heard. It's a ghost yeah. named Clarence. And I can't remember the real—it's the story that he killed his wife, and then he killed himself— he caught her with a lover. I'm not sure exactly. He There's found so many... his wife with another man. That's yes. what it was. And then he shot and killed killed his wife. After that, he couldn't handle the guilt, took his own life, and it says from eight stories up. So mm-hmm. The top floor of the Drury, where you were, that whole top floor was a brothel. It was because a brothel. back yeah. in the day, so Wichita is kind of separated by a river. Mm. everybody in this town will tell you we have the big Arkansas and the little Arkansas River. There's a confluence, which is a very powerful place where two rivers meet. They are not the Arkansas Rivers. Nobody here calls them the Arkansas Rivers. So just so you know, when we say Arkansas, we mean it. And that's what everybody in town calls it. So on one side of the Arkansas River is the... Delano area. Yes. So back in the day, that was like the cow town. They had mm-hmm. cattle drives that went through Wichita. And so your saloons and your prostitutes and the gunfighters were all the Wyatt Earps, you know, they're all kind of, well, Wyatt Earp might have made it to the other side of the river, but that's pretty much where it was different. You know, it was, it was more of the Wild West on that side of the river. And then the Drury was built on the other side of the river. But that's kind of where the activity supposedly Mm -hmm. stopped as far as the illicit, crazy activity. Yeah. So that does make sense to me that the Drury would have been used in the 30s during Prohibition. Mm -hmm. They would have brought alcohol in there because it'd be so dang easy. Yes, it is so easy to get it in and out. And then it was especially easy to run those illegal shops out of it like brothels and areas where prostitution and women could just be used and bought and everything. Around this time, I actually I don't know how I came to know this information. I think I got it from another history teacher uh, because you know you have <laughs> as those history thi- teachers yes, do. Yes, you have those things where you all sit around a little powwow and say, "Hey, let's talk about this interesting stuff that's happened in the area of the brothel." There was um, unconfirmed whether or not it was a serial killer within Wichita or whether or not it was a traveling serial killer went through and wiped out several women in, in the Drury that was that were working up in that brothel. There were a lot of similarities with with Jack the Ripper. Interesting. And so they think that he took a lot of inspiration from Jack the Ripper. Mm. Mm-hmm. And he he they know that he killed at least four women, but it was speculated to be upwards of eleven or twelve prostitutes wow. wiped out. And then we're just going to ignore that history. Yep. Because it's easier to act like that didn't happen. As right? quickly as he came, it was as quickly as the murder stopped. Wow. In the Drury. In the Drury. Uh, now, up in that top floor. What stories have you heard? Because I have a friend who worked there for years. Mm-hmm. And he and it was the Broadview Hotel for years. Mm-hmm. So now it's a chain. But it's the original building. Built in, what would you say, 1910, 20 in there? Probably. Yeah, early, I would say 1900s, okay. definitely. And... He said, so a lot of the flight crews that come in and out of the airport, they would, for some reason, they stay down there. A lot of them do. Mm-hmm. And they would go to their rooms. And he said it was just not uncommon for them to grab their bedding and just go sleep in the lobby because they couldn't handle it. He said that there was just so many reports of hauntings mm-hmm. in that hotel. What have you guys heard about that's happened there? I've, uh, I've, heard, cl- or I've heard people hear scratching. Um, I've heard people hear screaming. Um, I've heard people hear not walking, but like heavy sprints, like heavy sprinting, like running away from something like a grown man sprinting. I do know that when I spoke to people there, they're not afraid of him. From what I heard, they said Clarence was actually a gentle soul Mm -hmm. and just kind of snapped. And they, they just will tease around and say, Oh, that's just Clarence. And I don't know. Um, when we were there, I didn't have any experiences because I was kind of in and out and doing things. It's not meant to scare people. I mean, I think you need to, to view a part of history. You need to go and, and stay there. It's, it's great. What's the other, the other, oh, the, you know, the Ambassador Hotel? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was, 
that is historical because they had that sit-in. Dockum. Dockum. I actually talked to someone at one time who was there. He worked security. He's not there anymore, but he told me that on the second floor, there was an area that they he just wouldn't go. And I was, okay, what's going on? We don't know. There's something up there. And he was very serious. So I did go up and do an investigation with a friend and... It was very interesting. I got a picture. I took several pictures, and I do have one. Of, there's something in, in the corner of the room. And we tried several ways of retaking it several times, and it just was not the same. And there was a cold, a cold spot, and there were no vents around it. And we looked in the walls to try and check. But, you know, it's still not 100% accurate on my part because I would need to, to work on that more. Right. But it was... It was um, an interesting experience. I don't know if anybody else has... I went there a couple of times. I took a tour up there, and we actually sat and and did a mock, kind of like a mock investigation. You can't do it with a whole group of people because they talk, and the electricity was right. on. But it was something that they learned. But it makes sense that that building would have activity. And Sid, you can probably speak a little bit more to the Dockham sit-in because that was... The black kids, they were teenagers, I mm-hmm. believe, at the time. They wouldn't be served at the drugstore. They right. Were, and they went, weren't allowed to sit at the counter, mm-hmm. which just really bothers me when you think back historically. It wasn't that long ago. Nope. So these kids went in, and they staged a sit-in. And right. so it's pretty legendary. Absolutely, especially in terms of civil rights. And that's where that happened. Yeah. It was on the bottom floor of what's now a hotel. And that's the one thing I love about Wichita is that the— is that— Everywhere you go, there's some kind of history. Mm-hmm. There's some kind of cool, like, uh, like there's some kind of cool history. The dock I'm sitting at the ambassador with civil rights. Um, the it's cool, but it's sad. The bro- the the brothels at the Drury. Uh, what we're gonna get into now, even with the history of some of the haunts in some of the schools, because there's like three or four different schools that. If and you I do want to talk about that too. Yeah, if you look up. Haunted schools in Wichita, the school that I work at now pops up as like the second haunt, second most haunted <laughs> school in Wichita. But that's one of the cool things that I love is that like while you can tie in haunts, you can also tie in history. Dockham, Dockham is something that not a lot of kid that not a lot of people know about. But um, I did and they teach, should. They, they should, should, yes. And we do acknowledge it here. We have a sculpture mm-hmm. right down there. Yes. That's yeah. life size with the, mm-hmm. with the counter and the kids sitting at it. Yeah. And it was wild that, and it was wild that Kansas was a free state. But they still, you know, they fought for Kansas State to stay a free state. They fought for the civil rights for Kansas. And there was many people who fought against that. Correct. So Correct. And so, you know, to have sit-ins like that where it was still rights had to be proven shows that no matter what you did, the history is always going to be there. Right. Well, and just going back to like the haunted tours, the other places, because we do the we do the Orpheum and the Scottish Rite Temple is one, but you will not get much out of the owners or anybody there. So the Scottish Rite Temple, which is, it's kind of looks like a castle yes. mm-hmm. of a building. It's really cool looking and you walk in and you definitely get that vibe. Um, I don't no. know the history of it. I just know that they're, they don't, they're very secretive. Very. Yes. One thing that just last week, one of my friends was telling me about and he I was recently there. He works at a radio station. They had a band performing there, Mm -hmm. and they were doing their sound check. After my friend showed up, he's talking to him, and and the guy says, you know, weirdest thing happened today because he said up in the balcony there was a guy just sitting up there watching the whole thing, and we're kind of waving at him, but he wasn't responding to us or anything. And my friend said, well, you can't get up there. There wasn't anybody there. Mm -hmm. That's closed off. They don't use it. People don't get up there. They don't get up there. And he's like, no, there was somebody watching our sound check today. And he's like, no, there wasn't. Oh, my. There couldn't have been anybody (laughs) watching your sound check. But the band was so sure of it Uh that they're like, that's weird. The guy's just staring at us but not responding because, you know, you're playing music. You're like, hey, dude, what's up? And he's nothing. That's really common to see. And when we get to the schools, I will say that, we have not been able to go in and do anything there, but it does have a history. And then there is a building beside it that a guy was electrocuted. There's been all kinds of myths. There's been a myth that the Scottish Rite was built on top of a cemetery. And, yeah. Well, and just a you know, Scottish Rite mm-hmm. temple. 
Yeah, because the last time we were in it, one was for a wedding, and then we did the uh, Metropolitan Ballet mm-hmm. uh, perform the Nutcracker there. And, and then the Taylor Swift tribute concert. <laughs> But then after all that, we did uh, the one that I, I'm sad about. There's two of them, and I'll do the sad one last. The other one is Eaton House Square. She, uh, we, mm-hmm. When she, what was her name? Carrie, Carrie Nation. Nation. Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation, sorry. There used to be a radio station there, too, but it was three floors. And on the third floor, they had never, they had never touched it. And that building's been around a long time. It's on a street called um, Douglas and Emporium. They would hear things up there. The original wallpaper was there still. It was red, and they said someone had died up there. And one of the hosts of the radio station said he went up there and saw someone walk by and said hello and followed into that room, and there was nobody there. And I know people who worked at that radio station way back in the day, and they all said that. Oh, that's just crazy. They all said it was haunted. And now that is a, a, it was a hotel for a while, and businesses in it. And now it's in apartments. Right. So one of my mm-hmm. friends lived in that building, and he said, I go, is it haunted? And he goes, oh, yeah, it's haunted, for sure. It's haunted here, that way. Like the new addition that's built on, that is not haunted, he says. He goes, it's as if you walk into the older part of the building, and he said you can feel it. He said that's where it's haunted, but not in the newer part. Yeah, we, and, you know, I, I'd love to go in there, too. But the one that makes me sad is Mead's Corner. And Mead's Corner was torn down and very active. And that's why we always stopped on the tour with that building. The people who owned it were awesome. They would tell stories to my guests that I was taking on the tour and tell them about what they would hear. Um, a lot of activity on the second, especially when they, the second floor, especially when they started doing some renovations, yes. which that's very common. And, um, but then they tore it down. It was a historical landmark, and I just, I was just heartsick when that happened. Well, and there's a lot of hauntings because that's that's just kind of a area of town. Because the right. Eaton Hotel's right there, the Drury's a couple blocks away, the Ambassadors right there. There's another theater right there. It's haunted. I used to work there. Mm-hmm. Across the the river, you know, going west where the Delano brothels were a lot of those buildings are the original Mm -hmm. and i don't think Mm -hmm. people know that uh i know there was a novelty store there one of my students former students her grandparents owned it and it was where everybody would go in there to get costumes and things and they had a haunting up on the third floor and then there was the bridal it's that tuxedo bridal shop and it's still there it's yeah but if you go Mm -hmm. around to the back they have a coal chute Mm -hmm. and um we went down there that's pretty creepy they said they have noises on their top floor as well and then there's a senior citizens building down there that always has a puddle of water water up here and they don't know why in the gym area i wanted to ask you about that because i've been to that building quite a few times and i've heard from other people it was haunted and i was wondering what you had heard so it's a yeah water issue well they they, it's right in the middle of the floor in the middle of the building there's no reason why there should be a water puddle appearing there and they would come in and there it would be and they'd clean it up and it'd show back up and you know the building was closed and then um, one of the ladies there that had made cookies and stuff said oh yeah we've we've heard things we'll hear walking and we'll go look and nobody's there and we cannot figure out where this water puddle is coming from because there's nobody in there doing it. And they've, they've tried, you know, sitting doing stakeouts and look and nothing. So, and you know, when you think about Wichita too, it's not just the wild West cattle drives. I mean, the history goes back thousands of years with the native Americans. Mm-hmm. So when you think about it, you don't know what happened. Because the senior center, you would drive by it. You would never pick up on, oh, that's a haunted right. building. You wouldn't do that. I think it's what's There's other it. buildings yeah. that you can pick up on. That's a haunted building. Sure. But that one you don't. And so it makes you wonder what happened on that land, maybe. Exactly. And I, I agree with that. There's so much history going on. And I love history. You know, I'm an English teacher. And my son's history. So we just kind of mesh together, which is, is amazing. Because I'll ask him questions and about history of this or that. And he loves getting into to reading about the history and the haunts and, and just everything about Wichita because Wichita is pretty cool. Sid, what would you say is one of your most favorite haunted buildings or hotel, whatever, or one that you find particularly interesting? And it might be because of the backstory. Yeah. Particularly interesting is Brooks Middle School. 
It's a newer one. So it hasn't been around nearly as the oldest build it for a reference. The oldest school in 259 is East High. It was built in the 1800s. There is a plaque in the front of the building dedicated to students that were drafted into World War One that died. That's a haunted school. Yes. Like you can tell that's when you drive by it. And, and then you go, that's a haunted school. It's um, feeder school is the one that I work at now, which is Robinson, which was built in 1930, which does have a lot, which does have quite a bit of paranormal activity that I'll get into in a second. But Brooks was built later on and Brooks was the first one to have kind of a air of paranormal activity. And what's funny about Brooks is that the reason, the way that I found out about it was from my dad who worked there. He came home and he was like, I thought that they were lying about Brooks being haunted. I was wrong. But the story of it goes is that there was a sixth grader and this is a little bit traumatic. So I'm so sorry. So this might be content warning, trigger warning. There was a sixth grader who was after school at her locker. And then there was somebody who was pretending to be a custodian that gained access to the school in like no. the eighties or nineties ended up raping the sixth grader, Ugh. killed her body was in the locker all for spring break. They didn't find her until they came back. And ever since then, she is, she, the legend had is it has it that she has haunted around the school and students in specific down this one hallway. There's one hallway. It's the only hallway that echoes. No other hallway has an echo, but if you scream down the hallway where they found her body, it'll echo. And then after certain points, when it's just the janitor, she will like to, she likes to torment the janitors. I get it. She likes to mess with them. She'll hide their stuff. She'll trip them down the stairs. She'll um, just trip them in the hallways in general. You can hear little girl laughs up and down the hallway. You can hear her just like running her fingers or like running her hands like this across the locker. You know, whenever you touch a locker, you can hear the metal clanking. You can hear that and nobody's there. You can see doors open on security camera. And that was a legend that I heard from my dad. And my dad's experiences was he heard about the, or he heard the story about the echo, did the echo, realized that that was in fact correct. And then right after that, he started to hear some giggling. And then at that point was when he hightailed it out. And that wraps up part one of our conversation with the Kansas ghost lady, Tina Sorensen, and her son, Sid Sorensen. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything commercial free, become a gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts and try it for three days free or go to patreon.com slash the grave talks. Find everything there. Also, I'll add free. I'm Carol Hughes. And for all of us at the Grave Talks, thanks for listening.